Hello. Hi. Thank you so much. It was like completely accidental because I never set out to write a book. She might call herself an accidental author, but Sarah Kenzier intentionally set out to be a journalist and an anthropologist with a PhD from Washington University. And I ended up writing on how um, dictatorships uh, use the internet and how those oppose them also use the internet and the different issues of propaganda and trust and activism that come into play. Along the way, she became a social media maven and a wife and mother living and writing in St. Louis. Now her collection of essays, written between 2012 and 2014 for Al Jazeera English, have moved from the virtual world of ebooks to the tangible pages of print in her book, the View from Flyover Country, Dispatches from the Forgotten America. The essays are directly about the Midwest, directly about uh, St. Louis in particular, but generally it's about the decline of U.S. institutions and trust, um, you know, throughout the country and also to some extent internationally. Kenzier ended up using her experiences to research social and political issues in the United States, which has served her well during and since the 2016 presidential election. In fact, Kenzier was among the first journalists to predict Donald Trump would win, seeing signs that others missed. The number's probably 28, 29, as high as 35. In fact, I even heard recently 42 percent. I'll never forget, there was one time where he said unemployment is 40 percent. And everyone laughed at that because it sounded so ridiculous to them because technically unemployment was something like 5 percent. But I kept thinking, that is how it feels. It feels like it's 40 percent because people are underemployed, because people can't pay their bills, because people are going to lose their homes or have lost their homes or can't find a job that fits their skill set. It feels like 40 and so it doesn't matter if it's true, it matters if it feels true. And that's his gift, unfortunately. Kenzie is more than just a passive observer. Out of college, she worked for the New York Daily News as an online reporter and pushed for coverage at the site of the 9-11 bombings. You need to disperse immediately or you will be subject to arrest. Do it she now. was also at the Ferguson riots in 2014. The Ferguson started out as, as people mourning for somebody who'd been killed and his body left in the street. And from there it turned into a movement. Um, and I think a lot of times people think, you know, there's some sort of driving ideology and there is that, but there's just, you know, there's an emotional component um, that I wish people would consider. Not one to mince words, Ken Zier used Twitter to call out the media. Quote, people were grieving, fighting, running from tear gas, she tweeted, and the media enjoyed it. I wouldn't have a platform, I wouldn't have a career, and I wouldn't have some friends, you know, that I have if it weren't for Twitter. Ironically, Kenzier's use of Twitter rivals that of President Trump, a common target of hers. She also sees Twitter and the internet as a voice for those who feel they're not heard. When people in foreign countries um, criticize their government and stood up you know, to their government online, they are often cheered on by Western commoners. But, and this kind of foreshadowed um, the Ferguson uprising in Black Lives Matter, when black Americans uh, would do the same thing, would talk about systemic racism, um, would criticize government policies, they would be you know, often libeled or slandered. Oh, I'm so nervous. Oh my God. <laughs> It's these timely observations that have put her center stage on the cable networks and even mainstream media. She's the go-to pundit with the credentials to back up her thoughts. I think that, you know, American people still are on the ball. It's the American government uh, that I'm very concerned about. We discuss her views and so much more on this Maryville Talks Books one-on-one -on -one with Sarah Kenzier, presented by Maryville University and Left Pink Books and media sponsors St. Louis Public Radio 90.7, KWMU, and HEC-TV. Well, we are on the campus of Washington University, your alma mater, Sarah Kenzier. We're so glad to have you here. In fact, you were an anthropology major here at WashU. How did your passion for global issues develop from there, or did it? I guess it started at that point. Um, well, that was where I got my PhD. Um, I got my PhD in anthropology from here. Um, before that, I had studied history, um, focusing on authoritarian states, especially authoritarian states um, in the former Soviet Union. And so when I started here um, in 2006, I already had that interest in mind. Um, you know, I planned to pursue that for my dissertation topic. And I ended up writing on how um, dictatorships uh, use the internet and how those oppose them also use the internet and the different issues of propaganda and 
trust and activism that come into play. Uh, at the time, I thought, you know, this is a topic that's very relevant uh, to countries like Uzbekistan, which is the main country I studied. And unfortunately, I've had to transfer those skills uh, into studying the United States under Donald Trump. Yeah, I do want to talk about that. And so your book, The View from Flyover Country, Dispatches from the Forgotten America, it is a collection of your essays that you wrote about about the Midwest for Al Jazeera, and that was from 2012 to 2014. Mm -hmm. What did you want the world to know about our part of the world? Some of the essays are directly about the Midwest, directly about uh, St. Louis in particular, but generally it's about the decline of U.S. institutions and trust um, you know, throughout the country and also to some extent internationally. I think that because I live here, um, I live in St. Louis, which in my mind never recovered uh, from the Great Recession, uh, it's sort of like we get all the bad stuff first. And so we tend to notice things kind of falling apart um, before other parts of the country do. And when you're living somewhere like New York or DC where things are very expensive, um, but they're also thriving, where there's all these centers of power, and you know, versus living in a place like St. Louis, um, you know, whose glory days, if you want to define them as that, are in the past, um, you know, you have a different perspective. And I think that the rest of the country, as time went on um, and as things continued to decline, became more and more Saint, like St. Louis and so you know in that sense the essays ended up being something a little ahead of its time. They gained uh, more popularity after Trump won the election. That's when people on the coast seemed to be like oh okay I get what she's been saying for all these years. So. Well you talk about the coast and you talk about flyover country. Explain to those who don't maybe understand what that means. Yeah, I mean, that's a term that, you know, since I moved here and before, he you know, I moved here, I, I was in Indiana, uh, I've heard a lot used in a very derogatory fashion uh, to describe, you know, I guess I could say our part of the country. And, you know, what I don't like about saying our part is that what they mean is basically everything from, like, New York to L.A. if you're flying over in a plane, which is obviously a ton of different states and different cities and different people and, you know, not a monolith. Um, but it's dismissed that way. It's kind of overlooked that way. You see that now uh, with the coverage of Trump, you know, where they'll call it Trump country, and they assume everybody voted for him, everybody has the same ideology, is of the same race, the same religion, you know, all these sorts of stereotypes. And so what they don't like, um, you know, what I've noticed in working for the media, being part of the media, is to have a view from this place, for people from here to speak out. Um, you know, I think you really saw that in Ferguson, uh, where they really tried, the national media tried to portray it as this kind of riot that they didn't understand, instead of really talking to folks who've lived here, who who've been experiencing uh, racism in, br in brutal conditions, or our labor strikes, or the election, or a variety of issues. They want to parachute in and parachute out. Um, and I try to fill in that gap um, and bring what I can you know, myself. And I like seeing authors in other regions uh, that tend to be overlooked doing that as well, in the South and in the Midwest. You're an Al Jazeera columnist. I was. And, well, you were. And an anthropologist uh, by study. Um, not a common job title anywhere, let alone here in the Midwest. <laughs> so you kind of said somewhat about the perspective of living in St. Louis. Um, has it helped you with these essays, too, uh, in terms of talking about social media, politics, economics, all these things that you do touch on? And then is, it, uh, is there one thing that happens in the world that gives you the idea to write about? Or is it just everyday life? Um, well, when I was working for Al Jazeera, I was responding uh, to the topics at hand, and you can see that um, throughout the book. And what kind of terrifies me is that these topics held up really well. Mm -hmm. You know, economic decline, uh, opportunities being hoarded by elites, uh, a feeling of paranoia and distress leading to conspiracy theories being spread in society. Those are all the sorts of stuff, um, you know, that I touched on and that, you know, I still tend to do now. Um, you know, unfortunately, we live in this crazy news cycle where you're kind of forced to respond to current events. You know, you're kind of rolling along, covering all the Nazi rallies and then there's a threat of nuclear war and you're like, well, yeah, the Trump era, so, yeah. Americans should not fear riots. They should fear apathy. They should fear acquiescence. They should not fear each other, but it's understandable now that they do. So you mentioned earlier about receiving your PhD from here at Washington University, um, studying the authoritarian regimes, and one of them was um, Uzbekistan, which is a former Soviet Republic. But you're now banned from that country. Tell us what you learned, what was going on there, and how it led you to write about issues here in the United States. How did that even 
come to be. I got interested in Uzbekistan, the, the other former Soviet republics of Central Asia, um, at my first job, which is at the New York Daily News, uh, because it was 9-11 and we had the war in Afghanistan. We had all these bases in the surrounding countries, and those countries really weren't being covered much at all. And so I kind of wanted, you know, as a journalist, to fill in those gaps and, and write about Central Asia. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it right. I want to learn the languages. So I went to Indiana University and got an MA, and I learned how to speak Uzbek. Um, and I was all set to go to Uzbekistan. When in uh, May 2005, the government fired on a protest of, you know, t about 10,000 people and murdered uh, 700 protesters. And then they blamed that protest on a group they called Acromia, which I managed to prove did not exist. It was invented by Uzbek state propagandists. And so I wrote a paper about that. It was published in a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, the Uzbek government was very unhappy about this. And I was, you know, not allowed to go in the country. And that actually it was true for a lot of Westerners who were even mildly critical of Uzbekistan. They were kicking everybody out, so I wasn't really unique um, in that respect, but it did uh, change the subject of, of my dissertation and of my work. And that's how it ended up being more about the United States. Yeah, about States. the internet and about, you yeah. know, what, what happened with that massacre called the Andijan Massacre is that all of the kind of you know, intellectuals and journalists and political opposition of Uzbekistan left. They went to all these different countries, but this was when blogs were kind of popping up, and so they were finally able to communicate with each other over the internet and kind of plan an opposition strategy. And so what I looked at was that process, like could this happen? Could they actually be a threat um, to this dictator who'd always been their dictator um, online? And you know what I found is that the internet really exacerbates distrust, um, anonymity, trolling, you know, all these issues we're dealing with right now in the U.S. Um, I was studying in terms of Uzbekistan back then, and you know I think it's true uh, the world over. I don't think anyone's immune from that. You talk about Twitter in your book and the power that it has. Explain how it can help for people who may not have a voice. My perspective's changed a bit um, since I originally wrote this because Twitter's changed. You know, it's been weaponized. It's been weaponized by foreign actors. It's been weaponized by uh, neo-Nazis. It's been weaponized by bots. You know, all these kind of things we read about now with Cambridge Analytica. Those hadn't happened yet. What was interesting at the time I was writing um, around, you know, between 2012 and 2014, it was after uh, the Arab Spring. Um, it was after the internet had proven, you know, a fairly important part of those revolutions and everyone was kind of looking at it that way. And when people in foreign countries um, criticized their government and stood up you know, to their government online, they were often cheered on by Western commoners. But, and this kind of foreshadowed um, the Ferguson uprising in Black Lives Matter, when black Americans uh, would do the same thing, would talk about systemic racism, um, would criticize government policies, they would be you know, often libeled or slandered uh, by Western media outlets, even though they're just expressing their opinion, and that goes for Latino activists, it goes for anybody who's kind of you know, marginalized um, and put upon you know, in the US. And I, just, I noticed that discrepancy see. Um, I don't see a difference between the two groups. I think when you're fighting for your freedom, you're fighting for your freedom. And so I, w I was kind of put off by the way they were portrayed. Is it a challenge to make sense of certain global issues in that medium, with that medium? It's in many ways a really terrible site. <laughs> they need to reform it badly because of the harassment and the trolls and all this kind of stuff. It's also a very powerful site. You know, I wouldn't have a platform, I wouldn't have a career, and I wouldn't have some friends, you know, that I have if it weren't for Twitter. Um, I think it's a very good and vital resource for sharing information if you have media literacy, if you're able to kind of discern fact from fiction, and that comes often from experience. And I do worry about the effect of Twitter and other social media media networks on young people um, who haven't developed those skills and in a world where you know you're getting bombarded with lies and conspiracy theories and propaganda and notably our government puts them out Trump has tweeted things like that and so the authority of information is really in question um, when people don't seem to have a grasp on the truth when people in fact propagate uh, alternative facts as they like to call them well, you mentioned Ferguson you were actually there yeah yeah during the, the writing and that time. You talk about living in a biracial neighborhood. Are you optimistic that America can overcome racism? Uh, no, I mean, I think we should all try. I think the obligation goes more on white people um, because we're the people who, you know, have the 
privilege and the leverage uh, in this situation. You know, I think that um, Ferguson started out as a vigil. You know, Ferguson started out as, as people mourning for somebody who'd been killed and his body left in the street. And from there it turned into a movement. Um, and I think a lot of times people think, you know, there's some sort of driving ideology and there is that, but there's just, you know, there's an emotional component um, that I wish people would consider. I wish people, white people, would try to put themselves, you know, in the shoes of, you know, black parents trying to raise kids when police can shoot their children and just walk away and just get away with it. You know, even if they didn't shoot with malicious intent, you know, it still happened. Somebody still died. And so until we kind of get very honest about that um, and acknowledge these structural inequalities, I don't know where we can go. You know, I do think in some sense we've, we've made some progress. I think people are more aware, um, you know, of systemic inequalities that you could have all the money in the world, but if you're black, you could still get profiled on the street, get profiled in the mall. I do think people understand that. I think the younger generation actually is better with that. Uh, I see more open-mindedness among kids and teenagers. So like, if, if I have hope for the future, um, it's with them. Uh, what do you say to, the, to that next generation? Uh, what can they do? Well, the main thing is, you know, tell the truth. Uh, be honest, even if everyone around you is lying, even if you feel like the stakes are high. Um, and I think, you know, think of others, be helpful, do the right thing, you know, because it's the right thing to do. I think when laws are, are fading, when norms have been shattered, uh, you have to turn to your moral conscience. And that means, you know, being good to other people, looking out for the most vulnerable people and standing up for them. And I do see young people uh, doing that. I think a lot of times younger people see things uh, more clearly these days because we, you know, older folks have grown up with a set of expectations. Let's talk about our justice system. Do you believe that reform in our justice system in St. Louis City and the county is on the way to justice for all? No, I'm pretty frustrated by the lack of meaningful reform since Ferguson. You know, as we know, St. Louis has 90 municipalities, and so you can try to solve a problem in Ferguson and you're left with 89 versions of the same situation. And I think there's more awareness of the situation, of things like um, shakedowns by police on, you know, uh, traffic tickets, for example, to fund departments. You still have underfunded departments. You still have widespread poverty. You still have an unequal school system. You still have all these problems. And I think there are also local activists. I mean, that's the good thing about St. Louis is, you know, people work very hard, often with very little resources for change, and they continue to work, even though the conditions are very tough. You know, I know a lot of people have PTSD from fighting all of these battles, but they care. And so I think we actually have a lot of really good people here, and we just need, uh, you know, more, more money, more resources, and uh, more people to kind of wake up and realize this isn't a zero-sum situation. If some people's lot improves, it doesn't mean things get taken from you. I, I guess that's what I wish people would understand more than anything. You are also widely credited for being really among the first journalists to predict that Donald Trump would win the presidency. And you explain in your book, and you did this on the television programs that you were a guest on, how it was missed by the media and by political pundits. How did you reach this conclusion? Oh, uh, well, there are a few things that gave me unfortunate expertise into this. You know, one, as I said, I used to work at the New York Daily News. I understood New York tabloid media, how they portrayed Trump. I understood how Trump worked the media. Um, you know, the media has been in bad financial straits for a long time. Trump was a cash cow. He gave them ratings. He gave them money. They didn't care that he, he launched his campaign saying that Mexicans were murderers and rapists. They didn't care about his bigotry and his hatred. They were going to roll with that and make money, and he knew it. He worked them really well. The other thing, um, you know, I've studied authoritarianism, I've studied demagogues, and I've studied, you know, white racists in the U.S. And with Trump, you kind of get all those things colliding, and it's really up to a system of checks and balances to kind of keep him, um, keep a character like that at bay. You know, we've had people like this in our history for a long time. And then the third thing, honestly, um, around the fall especially, I, I was noticing that the government was not addressing the Russian interference issue. I was really surprised by the way parts of the media were just lying about it. You know, they were saying there's no connection between Trump and Russia. And I'm like, well, what's going on? And I, of course, now we have Mueller, who is trying to figure out what exactly is going on. Uh, we still don't know the full official story, but I became very worried that that may tip the election. I never thought he'd sweep, but I thought it would be close. Um, and I thought he had a serious shot and that nobody should treat it like a joke. Right. 
And you mentioned this on the air with Al Jazeera and Oh, I mentioned it every blogs. opportunity I got because I was feeling really panicked. Um, what was the know, reaction back then when you during that time? People thought I was crazy. They thought I was crazy to even think that he had a chance of winning, um, in part because of the polls, in part because I think people had greater faith in American institutions than in American people. I mean, the other thing is, you know, I was, re I was reporting from here, so I would go to the Trump rallies, and I would also go to towns um, that had a lot of signs for Trump, and, you know, a lot of people were going to vote for him. And so I kept meeting people who were going to vote for Trump. And often they weren't all that enthusiastic. They're kind of like, I hate both of them, but I always vote Republican, or I'm pro-life, or I just want the economy to get better. So I guess I'll, I'll go for it. I think that because the media is really conglomerated in these very liberal cities on the coast, they didn't meet anyone just in ordinary, regular life. They only met these kind of, you know, people at the rallies who were just wild and over the top and made it almost seem like a spectacle. But this is a serious thing, and a lot of people really bought into, you know, his, his lies. And I do feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for anybody, you know, who's having trouble paying their bills. But I think that a lot of people felt like, okay, someone finally gets it. Someone's finally saying that things are bad, that times are tough, and that we need help, and that he's offering to help us. So, hey, you know, as Trump famously said, what do you have to lose? And well, do you fear that we Midwesterners um, will be so discouraged that we will accept the status quo? Or have we lost our hope for the, quote, moral arc to lean toward justice? I think that moral arc needs to be pushed. Um, I think people realize that. You know, I think that you know you get a variety of opinions here. You find people who, who do still really like Trump. You find some supporters who are disillusioned. You find a, you know a bunch of people, especially in St. Louis, who never liked him. We're never um, for him, and we're out have been out protesting him since he got in office. So you find all that. You know, one thing I find when I talk to. Um, I want to separate like Trump fans from Trump voters. People voted for him, feeling a little ambivalent. They're not happy, you know, because he didn't fulfill any of the, you know, the promises. They're not necessarily going to go talk to the media about it because they hate the media. And I honestly can't blame them a lot of the times because the media shows no interest in them except for on, you know, a hurricane or Ferguson or an election. Otherwise, you know, they, they know when they're being condescended to. They're not stupid. Uh, but I have seen some frustration. Um, I'm more, uh, I'm much more upset with our officials uh, than I am with ordinary people. Um, I think that Congress has really let us down, particularly the GOP. I think the judiciary uh, is under a lot of strain. Um, I think Trump is packing the courts with conservative judges that are just going to do his bidding. And all of that worries me more for the future than what citizens are doing. Because I actually think citizens are really on the ball. You know, they're, they're fighting, they're standing up for each other, they're doing a good job. Are you optimistic that the Constitution can withstand this administration? And I will quantify this with, under his predecessor, there were some liberties taken. So that kind of led the way for Trump, actually, or whomever was going to follow. Right. But what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think that's true. And I think that, that what happened with Trump is people realized how much of our government stability rests on norms and not just laws. And Trump does abuse the law. You know, a lot of his executive orders have been unconstitutional. But the ability to send out executive orders and the ability to have executive control, uh, you know, was strengthened under Obama. And I think that people didn't see that as a potential danger for a demagogue or a sort of proto-authoritarian leader because they just didn't envision that kind of thing happening in America. You know, we've always been a democracy. I don't think that they saw somebody like him coming. I think, you know, the Constitution is only as good as the people who enforce it. You know, and the same is true of checks and balances. Unfortunately, a lot of our officials aren't good at all. Uh, they're either complicit or you're seeing record numbers of people quitting. They just want out of this. They feel like it's very corrupt um, and they want out. And that leaves things in a constantly uh, chaotic state. Uh, as well as a state that's advantageous for some of Trump's lackeys who are at heart kleptocrats. They just want to make money. They're using the White House like an ATM, uh, and they don't care about what citizens are going through. How do you handle the opposing views? And I'm sure you've had many people that have that point-counterpoint. Yeah, I mean, I'm fine if people disagree with me. You know, if they come into the debate with facts and with their own prerogative and their own opinion, I'm totally up for having a, you know, a good faith debate. What I don't like is just, you know, slander, lies, trying to argue about a completely different topic, like that kind of nonsense, which of course you see all over the internet. But I'm usually happy, you know, to meet somebody who has a different opinion from me because, I mean, how else do you learn about the world? How else do you learn about what other people are thinking? And I don't think, it would be really creepy to me if everyone agreed with me. Is That's it challenging for you? Does it help you come up with another thought process? Yeah, yeah, sometimes it is. If the person's an intelligent person and they're making a good argument, yeah, I mean, I take that seriously. I think that's good. You know, it freaks me out when everybody's in agreement. That's what a fascist state is like. Mm. True, because they're telling you how you're going to think and 
Yeah, or Skew there's just an obligation right. for everybody to kind of reiterate the same views because they feel afraid to express themselves. And you know, the best thing is for people to, to be able to express freely what they're thinking. In May 2012, I received my PhD, but I still do not know what to do with it. I struggle with the closed off nature of academic work, which I think should be accessible to everyone. But most of all, I struggle with the limited opportunities in academia for Americans like me, people for whom education was once a path out of poverty and not a way into it. You have your PhD from here, from Washington University, yet you write very critically of the academic world. I found it very enlightening because I didn't know enough about it to understand that you've written a paper, but myself and maybe others in the world may never see the works that you do, that folks do in uh, academ academia. Why is that? And then when you go out into the world, they're not paying you. Right. Oh, yeah. You talk about that with the economy in general, but it, it certainly is academia. Yeah, it's a borderline uh, Ponzi scheme, basically, where you know people are working for prestige instead of money, and that prestige does not lead to a payoff, and people struggle to get by. And that's th true uh, of people who have the highest level of education possible, you know, have a PhD, and then you see people, you know, struggling who have GEDs as well. Like I feel like there's kind of a systematic exploitation problem. But yeah, in terms of academic papers, um, you know, the way it works is when you publish in an academic journal, uh, it allegedly is supposed to count big on the job market. I haven't really found that to be the case, but it's then paywalled, um, and then that journal will charge people an incredible amount of money to read it, like something like, you know, $25 or something, which, you know, like a subscription to the, to the Washington Post is like a buck. So you're sort of like, yeah, you know, what are the odds that people are going to actually pay up and, and download this thing? And so why are they doing it? Uh, and they do it to put up that barrier. Uh, it, it's very elitist. It's not about the dissemination of knowledge. It's about the hoarding of knowledge and sort of sending out signals to different institutions like this person's a serious scholar and all that. I mean, that to me, I had no interest in that. Like, I really wanted to inform the general public with my work. I'm like, what's the point? Like, if people can't read it, what's the point of it? Yes, you know, so I, I found that to be really frustrating. That you had the avenue of the internet and uh, right. media. Right, yeah. And I think that things have changed a bit since I wrote those essays. Um, I think a lot of social scientists in particular realize how valuable their expertise is now. You know, you're seeing a lot of best-selling books by professors um, and others who've studied things like, um, you know, how authoritarian states form, how democracies die, all these unfortunate topics. And I think that the public um, maybe has some greater appreciation for that. And I think some of it is people need to speak in, like, normal English without any jargon, without all this academic nonsense. Because nobody cares about this academic, you know, inter-academic debates. And so I think people have realized that, and they realize that, you know, they've got something to offer, and, and the response has been good. So I do think there's been positive change. Tell me about your process when you write and organizing these essays, and particularly for this book. How do you go from them standing alone to making it flow in the book? Was that a challenging process? Or it was easy? like completely accidental because I never set out to write a book. Like I wrote all these essays individually, you know, as in response to current events, when I was working for Al Jazeera, uh, once I left, I had a lot of demand from my readers saying, you know, I really like your work. Is there a place we can get it where it's all in one place? I didn't think that a book publisher would want like a bunch of things that had already been published online. So I self-published this in 2015. And to my surprise, uh, it was a big bestseller. It was popular when it first came out. It got extremely popular after the election. And then there's a demand for a print version with new material, um, you know, which is what this is. But, you know, I arranged them. I tried to kind of make them flow. I tried to, to divide them by topic. I'm glad, <laughs> hopefully, you think it does. Um, but, you know, uh, there are some common themes. There are themes of, you know, corruption, uh, injustice, hypocrisy, all kinds of fun stuff that uh, un unfortunately bind these uh, themes together. Is writing a catharsis for you? Is it cathartic at all? Um, uh, and I guess a form of activism? Yeah, I mean, it, it is cathartic. You know, I like to write. You know, I just stylistically, I get some satisfaction out of it. I like, you know, sharing my work with readers. I like being able to explore a topic that's underexplored, um, things that aren't necessarily getting in the news. I feel some satisfaction out of that. You know, as for the, like, is it activism? That's a debate a lot of people are having now. My stuff's labeled opinion when it's opinion. And when I write a feature story, I leave myself out of it. I usually take a kind of ethnographic approach and remove myself from the situation entirely. But, you know, um, it becomes activism in this kind of political climate, you know, even inadvertently. It's not like I'm setting out with some activist agenda, but when you live in a state that doesn't value the truth, that's often trying to suppress the truth, then telling the truth uh, can be seen as a radical act. And I don't think of myself as a radical person, but that's, you know, that's how I'm characterized sometimes, and I think it's more a reflection of the political climate we live in.